tell us your name, where you're from, um, and that you're, uh, you can even give us your uh, division, your rank, give us that background information. Okay. okay. Okay, my name is George Kalikia. I was born and raised in Little Falls, New York, May 19th, 1928. I uh, got drafted into the service September 20th, 1950. I, uh, from there, I went to uh, Herkimer by train. We went to Fort Devens, Massachusetts for processing. From Massachusetts, I got shipped up to uh, what they call a Fort Myers, Virginia, which is just outside of Washington, D.C., where I took my basic training. Most of the training was done in Fort Bellevue, but uh, we were stationed in uh, Fort Myers. That was our home, uh, home base. We had basic training for approximately about, I'd say, around 12 to 14 weeks. And uh, from there, after basic training, I got transferred to Fort McNair which is right in Washington, D.C. It's the home of General Bradley. And I was supposed to be in the honor guard there. The, uh, what they do there is uh, whenever the president leaves town or comes or something, they have an honor guard. Or when somebody dies, you, uh, the soldiers march to escort the case on to the Arlington Cemetery. And I was there probably about, oh, anywhere between a month and two months. I went home on leave. I had a 30-day leave coming after basic. And I got back, and all of a sudden, commotion going on. I said, what's going on, guys? He said, hey, hey, George, you see your name on the board? I said, what do you mean? He says, eh, we're going to get shipped out. I said, what do you mean shipped out? I said, we just got here. So then all of a sudden, the boys all went over looking at the map. We had a big map on a wall, and uh, it was a map of Japan and Korea. And I says, what do you mean? What, what are you looking at? He says, well, he says, we want to see where Korea is because that's where we're going. I said, no, nah, we won't be going over there. Oh, yeah, yeah. So sure enough, uh, we turned around and found out where that little island of Korea was, which back that time we knew the war was on, but nobody, you know, paid any much attention to it while we were in basic training. And so from there, sure enough, we got shipped out to Seattle, Washington. My orders were to go to Seattle. And I left Washington by train. We went all the way to Seattle. Took us about a little over 10 days to two weeks to get there. And uh, up over top of the mountains and everything. And everywhere we went, we stopped and picked up another bunch of soldiers as we went along. And the longest we stayed was in uh, Billings, Montana. I'll never forget that. They let us... Finally let us get off the train for a couple hours, but we were sitting on that train from Washington all the way. You couldn't move, you know. It was just sitting and going, sitting and going, and bump, 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 and it wasn't one of these trains that we have today. So anyway, we got to Seattle. We were processed there. They gave us all our winter gear, and we got a rifle, no ammunition. And then from Seattle, they put us on ship. And from the ship, we went to Yokohama, Japan which uh, was quite a sight for me. I says, boy, I didn't go too far out of Little Falls back in my days when I was a young kid. I was uh, 22 years old when I got uh, sent out there. And we stayed in Yokohama, oh, I think it was probably two, couple of weeks anyway, somewhere around there. And then we got back on the same ship, and down around the corner we went and up over, up into Korea. We landed in Pusan, which is the most southern uh, city of, of Korea. It was the point, actually. And uh, from there, we stayed there for a few days, and then they put us on another train, which was all boxcars, which was orange crates and stuff like that for seats. And they gave us our rifles, but we didn't have no ammunition again, and we started north. We kept going on north, oh, probably about almost just about a whole day. And... Uh, farther north we went, the closer we could hear some shooting going on, which was the long artillery. It wasn't riflemen, it was artillery. We could hear that the guns going off. So all the guys kept calling, give us some ammunition, give us some ammunition. And they says, no, 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 no. So we got off, finally got off the train, we got on the truck, and from there we went to our outfits. And I was assigned to the 1st Cavalry Division, which is the 5th Cav Regiment, 
and I was put into Love Company. And the way I got into Love Company was that we were all lined up, and the uh, sergeant uh, that was in charge and says, I want three volunteers for the first squad. Step forward. Nobody would step forward. You, you, and you. So they stepped forward. So then finally, it came down to nitty gritty there. There wasn't too many of us left. And I need uh, four men for the fourth platoon, the mortar section. And this, I'll never forget this little sergeant. He was from New Jersey. And he kept edging me on. He says, come on, come on, come on, my Alfred. Come on, come on. He says, you'll be with me. So finally, I was the first one. I stepped forward. And I was glad I did. I got the 60 millimeter mortars. And from there, we were in Love Company, and we went to our uh, destination, which was probably about two weeks of, uh, it was in reserve. They were in reserve at that time. We was in reserves. And from there, after we got out of, uh, oh, they prepped us up a little bit on a little bit of training, what well, was about the old boys, or it was telling us just what was going on, see? And so... Uh, they give us a few war stories and this and that. Well, you know, that's nothing to it. I was just a young kid anyway. So anyway, the next thing I knew, we were going up this hill, and all of a sudden shooting started going on. And I said, wait a minute, this is for real. <laughs> so I didn't know what was going on during combat. They didn't know if it was going out or coming in. But anyway, that was my first experience of war was when they started shooting at us, and then the guy from up above was hollering down, send a uh, uh, suicide squad up. Send a suicide squad up. And what the hell was that? It's one squad of men, nine men, that they have that stays in the rear. And when they get to the top of the hill, these fellas go up, fix bayonets, and they're the first ones over the hill to hit the enemy. Everybody else stays over the crest of the hill, but these guys are the first ones over the top. Well, being that I was in a mortar squad, we were down at the foot of the hill, and we were setting up our mortars to fire over top of the hill. And uh, so these guys went up over there, and I think at that time, there was probably about two or three of them that were alive afterwards. And that was the last time we had a suicide squad in Love Company. There was nobody else. It was a strictly volunteer. Nobody with volunteers. So that was... Uh, my first experience in combat. Uh, one story comes along that uh, I picked out for uh, this here was at the time when uh, we was in, uh, just on the other side of Injun River, it was about August of 1951. And I was, of course, a, uh, at that time, I was uh, the rank of sergeant and I was a platoon sergeant. And we were getting ready to go out on patrols, and they were having the peace talks. Well, every once in a while, they would bog down. And when they bogged down, either we would have to wake them up by pushing a little bit, or the enemy would attack us. So we were more or less in a defensive position at the time. And, uh, but we'd go on these patrols and see where the enemy was, if they were bringing anything in, or what they were doing, and this and that. Well, I had been on this patrol two days before. And the day that uh, I left for this one was the sergeant in the third, third, third platoon, I think it was. He was second. He said to me, hey, George, he said, take my place today, and I'll do yours tomorrow. He says, go on that patrol for me. I said, yeah, okay. It's since, you know, it was about two, three-mile walk, and we'd go different checkpoints. It was probably about, oh, probably around eight or ten checkpoints. That we'd go to a certain spot, look around, and the lieutenant would write it down what, what we found and if there was anything that had been moved or anything brought in or whatever it was. So we just kept going along, going along. All of a sudden, we got up into this wooded area and uh, there was a, uh, a dry bed uh, opening between the two. It was like a side of a hill, but over to the other side of the hill, it was a big cliff like. And then there was all fields and then you can see the river. So we, was, we would stay on the left side of this hill, walking along there. And we finally got across this bed creek, and we kept going along, and all of a sudden, everything broke loose. We heard a lot of shooting and yelling, everything going on up front. I was probably about three-quarters back in the column because I was in charge of the uh, mortar squad. And uh, a couple of guys kept hollering back, bring up the machine gun, bring up the machine guns. Well, 
the day I went with our with my comp, uh, platoon, we had the machine gun up with the lieutenant. He was up front, but this lieutenant decided to have his machine gun in the rear. And so by the time they got up there, these guys are running back, and one guy's hollering, I got hit, and this one hollering, I got hit. And so they says, uh, machine gun guys start going up, and then all of a sudden, they turn around, they start coming back, and they says, everybody go back, go back, retreat, there's too many of them. So we all started to go back. Well, we got about, about as far as that opening goes, which was this dry creek bed, and... Uh, the enemy had encircled us. They cut us off. So myself, it was probably about four or five of us that stopped dead, and we just couldn't move anymore because the guys were getting hit. I'm mean, only going to get out there and get killed trying to run through that 20, 30-yard opening. So we came back, and they ran up into the woods with the rest of the guys. We went up into the woods, and there was about three foxholes there. So we had, all of us had gotten into foxholes, and we started, watching the perimeters all the way around to make sure that we were covered. We didn't have too much ammunition with us. We had a little bit, but not really a lot. So I didn't know how long we were going to be able to hold off. So we sort of waited, waited, waited to see. We waited for them to fire first. Well, I was at the front position where I can see through the woods, and I can see these North Koreans coming toward us. And they were probably, oh, maybe... 150 yards, 100 yards away through the trees, and they were cautiously coming through. So then I got one of the other fellows, and we start firing at them. Well, then they finally stopped, and they sort of, after we kept firing our M1s at them, they finally uh, stopped and start backing up a little bit. Well, I said to the fellows, I said, let's see if we can set the mortar up. Well, there was no, ro no place to set the mortar because we was under trees. In a mortar, you have to be in an opening area. So we stayed there. So finally, I turned around, and I looked, and one of the fellows says, Hey, the radio fellow's here. He's got the radio with him. So I hollered out to him, and I says, uh, You got the radio? He says, Yeah. I says, Well, try to get hold of the CP. Tell him what's going on. You know, we're trapped. We can't get out. And I was a, a two, uh, the squad sergeant of the mortars at that time. So I was the highest ranking one there, so I took charge. And he says to me, uh, I can't get anyone. I says, well, get, try get anybody. Just, just call and see. I said, you know the code, get anybody. So finally he got a hold of, uh, I think it was M Company, and uh, they had 81 millimeter mortars. And uh, he got a hold of them, and he said to me, what do you want me to tell them? I says, well, give me the radio. So I got the radio, and I says, tell them where our position is. And so I told him, I says, the only thing, I don't have the map, but the only thing I can tell you is we're to the left, of the river. I says, about three, four hundred yards. I says, why don't you drop in a smoke round and then I'll guide you from there. So, which they did, they dropped in a smoke round and I says, you gotta come left, you're about 300 yards away from us, so bring it in. So they finally dropped another one. Well, it was getting a little close. One of the guys says, hey, what are we gonna do? I'm dropping on top of our head? I says, if I have to, we will. I said, I ain't gonna let them guys get me. So they finally started driving live rounds. And just about then, we didn't hear another sound anymore. The enemy quit shooting at us. Everything got quiet except for a few of the wounded guys calling for medic, 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 you know. And I says, hang on, we'll get you out of here, don't worry. So in the meantime, they told me that uh, a colonel, a high-ranking uh, officer, was ordering the tanks to come in. He's trying to get a couple of tanks to come in and get us. And they refused because they said it was all mined. So the colonel turned around, he says, I'm giving you a direct order, you go in after them men. So two tanks came up to the riverbed, or I mean, I should say this uh, dry creek bed, and they came in and they got to us. Well, everything stopped then. We didn't hear a sound then. So we figured, well, the enemy had gone now. They heard the tanks coming in, so they, they took off. So in the meantime, we turned around and picked up what guys that were wounded there and brought them down. We didn't have too far to go, probably maybe 50 yards or so, and put them on the tanks. I threw my uh, carbine, I had a carbine, I threw that on the tank, and I said to this other fellow, I said, I think uh, there was another, I didn't know any of these boys' names. I didn't know none of their names because it wasn't my platoon. It was the other platoon that I was in with, the third platoon. 
And so I says, I think there's one more up in there. I says, he was over to my left, I know, unless somebody got him out, because there was only five or six of us. So we, him and I went back up in to look. Well, in the meantime, the Koreans start throwing mortar rounds in. Well, they start firing at the tanks. Well, the tanks hate mortars, and they hate a bazooka. So they just turn around, put the latch down, boom, they took off. And here, him and I are coming out there, and we're yelling, hey, wait, wait, wait for us, you know. We couldn't, they, wouldn't, they didn't stop. They, of course, they couldn't hear us anyway. So I says to him, one thing, buddy, cross that creek bed we're going, whether we get hit or not. I says, we're taking off. And we took off across that creek bed and got over on the other side. We got over as far enough to get away from where the, the, the mortars didn't reach us anymore anyway. So we started walking back, no rifle. He didn't have a rifle. We were blood on our shirt from carrying the poor guys out that were hit. And finally we ran into this, uh, I think it was the second platoon that was coming in to try to rescue us. And I told the lieutenant what was going on, what happened, everything else. I said, now, if there's anybody else in there, I don't know. I said, but there may be some more fellas in there. I said, but we took out what we could. And I said, I had no idea. I said, I know that uh, somebody says that uh, they didn't see the lieutenant coming back. Well, we got back to just about where our uh, position, starting position was. And... Uh, this uh, Jeep was sitting there with Colonel sitting in it with his driver. And he said to me, Sergeant, come here. And I went over there and he says, uh, what went on back there? So I told him what happened and everything. And he says to me, well, he says, good job. He says, jump in. So we got in the Jeep, him and this other fellow and I, we got in the Jeep and he says, what, uh, what company did you say you're with? I says, Love Company. He says, okay. He says, you're going to ride down. So he took us down the road. Our company was just marching down the road, and we were waving to him. <laughs> the guys that were walking out, they had to go across the river where we were set up on the other side of the river. And uh, so we went back over there. Well, when I got back over there, I says to the uh, fellows from the other uh, that, that had gotten out before we did, see, the ones that got out before they got trapped. And I says, did the uh, lieutenant get out? And he says, no, he says he got hit, but we think he got captured. We're not sure. He says, but we think he might have got captured. We didn't think he was hit that bad. So to this day, I don't know. I tried to find out, and somebody told me that uh, he did get captured, so he didn't get killed. Then somebody else had another story. They thought he did get killed, but I, to this day, I don't know, which is 50-odd years later, I... Never found out what happened to that lieutenant. But uh, the, uh, what you call, uh, what was that going on next? Uh, oh, after that, uh, I says to uh, a couple of the guys, I says, you know, it's strange. I says, why lieutenant put the machine gun? He says, well, he always thought that he wanted to protect the rear more than he wanted to protect the front. He knew we had enough riflemen up front, but he wanted to protect the rear more. Well, in this case, maybe if he hadn't called the machine guns up front, they might have been able to have kept that roadblock open, the creek bed open, see? But uh, as it was, why uh, that was it. But that was one of the experiences that I never know. Didn't think I'd ever get out of there, but then again, I had a lot of faith in myself. And being a Christian, I, I knew I think I pretty much, I never had, really thought that I was going to get captured or anything. I said, one way or another, I was going to get out of there. We did. And I would thank God for that. So when you were going through this experience, uh, I'm sure that things were happening so fast you just reacted. But tell me, how, how, what was that feeling like? Well, I, what I can really say that the feeling itself, you're, you're so busy looking around and checking things out, trying to think what to do next, what to do next, and keeping the guys from getting panic. Uh, I, I just, like I say, I had the feeling we were going to get out all along. I knew one way or another I was going to get out of there. If we had to make a mad dash or what, we were going to get out of there. You know, we were going to fight our way out or something. The only thing I did was worried about was the fellows, uh, when we first got in there, kept shooting, shooting, shooting. I was afraid we were going to run out of ammo. 
and we're going to get captured. That's the only thing I did not want because the North Koreans did not treat the soldier very well. I mean, they, they, they tortured him. One thing I did forget there, I found out when I got back that uh, one of the fellows, uh, they said so-and-so was missing that was with the lieutenant. And uh, come to find out about a day and a half later, this fellow shows up in camp where we were set up, and uh, he says that uh, he had hid in the bushes. He couldn't get out, so he hid in the bushes, and he made his way down to the river. And he got on a log, and at night, he paddled his way down the river and came all the way down to the bridge to the outfit. I says, how did you know which way to go? He says, well, the only thing I know is the water goes south, and that's the way I went. He says, I was just hoping I was going the right way. <laughs> But uh, it was quite an experience for him, too, that he did get out of there by uh, going down the river in a log. He made his way down through there. So, um, so how long were you uh, right in combat? How Over in Korea, all, all together in Korea, I was probably close to nine months. You go on, uh, you're there six, and you're supposed to go on R&R, &R, and I just kept waiting, 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 finally around... My seventh month, why I did get my R and R to go to Japan for five days, and uh, but off and on, why uh, we were there probably close around the nine months. The one of the scariest thing uh, I had was the uh, the last day. It was the day before the last day. I by then we we had no lieutenants left. Sergeants were platoon sergeants. They were all, all the platoons had sergeants to direct them, no lieutenants. We had a company commander for a lieutenant but, or a captain, but that was it. And uh, so our platoon, the mortar squad, was scheduled to up on Chorwan. It was up by the reservoir. We had to, uh, they loaded all the officers and the uh, platoon sergeants to go up and show us what position we would hold in case the North Korean broke through the South Korean lines. At that time, in the war, the South Koreans were trying to take over. We were letting their outfits stay in the front, and the Americans were backing them up, and all the other outfits were backing them up, more or less like a backup unit, see? And uh, so when we got in them jeeps and went up, we stopped uh, in the artillery uh, tent, had breakfast, and then from there, we moved closer to show us where we were going to set up. Well, the closer you got, the more the guns you heard going off, the more firing you heard going off. And the, just before that, oh, probably it was about a uh, few months before that, the sergeant that uh, I took his place was one day left. And he was standing up in a foxhole in the, our own artillery killed him. He was standing up and he had one day left to come home. And I just got down on my knees that day and says, I hope it never happens to me because I seen him get hit. And it, it was just terrifying. And from then on, I said, never get close to your men because it broke my heart. And I tried not to get that close to the boys that, you know, I did have a real close buddy that uh, him and I, every morning we'd go on patrols, and when I see him, he would go by, and I would be going another way. We'd be waving to each other. Hi, Mike. One morning he wasn't there. Mike, where's Mike? Mortar round came in and killed him. Things like that, that really get you right in the gut. How did you cope with that? Well, you go day by day, I guess. You know, you just have to, go, like I say, you go day by day. And you're just hoping that tomorrow it's going to be over with. Tomorrow we're going to go home. And I know when they told me, they says, uh, they're starting to bring in more reserves. And they said, the, fir the first cab is going to go home. They were going to pull them out of Korea. All the ones that were eligible, they were in the first cab. And the other fellows were going to be transferred into the other divisions. Well, that was one of the happiest days of my life when they said, but uh, instead of going home, they sent us to Hokkaido, Japan, which was the northern island of Japan. 
And I was up there probably around, I think, about three months. And we were waiting to be shipped out. We were supposed to go to San Francisco. And they were going to have one big celebration going underneath the bridge because the calf hadn't been home since before World War II. And they were, MacArthur's men were going to go home. Of course, MacArthur wasn't there. He had, Truman had already fired him. But uh, to my, my estimation, I think that uh, the, uh, MacArthur was doing a good job and he wanted to do the right thing. He wanted to bomb Manchuria. And I think that uh, if we had, the war probably would, would have never ended the way it did because there was too many Chinese there. But it was a political war. That's all it was. It was a police action. That's what they said. It was a police action. And to my estimation, the government ran the war. Let's talk about um, what was going on back home here. Uh, tell us a little bit about who was here waiting for you. Well, uh, <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't have a girlfriend. I had a girlfriend. And I was writing to her. And uh, when I was in Japan, uh, afterwards there, I met a, we were more or less, we had uh, what they call pen pals. And I was probably right to about three, four, and we were had, we had a lot of fun. I never went, wasn't going steady with any one girl while I was over there because I says I didn't want to be have any ties. You don't want somebody back home crying over your shoulder. And one thing, when I wrote home, we were urged to write letters as often as possible, and we used to write every time we had a break, we wrote a letter, even if you said the, "Hello, how are you? I'm still good," and everything. I never wrote about the war. I never wrote about being in action or anything else. I always told my mother, my father, my brothers and sisters, I says, you can read it in the paper. I says, I'm not writing about the war. And to this day, I've still got probably about, oh, 30, 40 letters that I had written home that my mother had put in the box. And she had saved them. And I had open heart surgery a couple of years ago. And while I was recuperating, I uh, got the box out and I started reading through them old letters. And uh, it sort of gets you a little bit, you know, when you uh, start reading home what you were telling mom, dad, you know. And uh, I just, uh, I don't know, I just, and I never talked to it about my kids. I never told my kids war stories. I just, I don't know whether it's something that I wanted to forget or what, but I never did. But most recently, when I opened up a little bit, I uh, put a big scrapbook together while I was uh, uh, getting uh, over my surgery, and I was putting all my pictures. I used, the pictures were all piled up in a box that I had sent home. And so I took them out and I put them in a scrapbook. And I know here about, oh, Probably about a month ago or so, uh, my daughter, oldest daughter, said to me, uh, she says, uh, where's that scrapbook? Do you ever, you know, put them pictures in there? And I says, yeah, and I took it out. That's the first I think she's ever went through that book and looked through it to see, you know, some of the pictures that when I was over in Korea. In Japan, basic training and everything else, I tried to put them in order. And I had a lot of little different trinkets. I found some propaganda sheets over there that I had sent home. And to my surprise that uh, they had saved them for me, and I brought a couple here just to, uh, that the, they can put in a historical society. I made copies of them. I have the originals, but I made some copies so that I'm going to present to them that they can put them in a book or something. Um, I'm going to come back to the propaganda sheet. Yeah. But uh, tell us what uh, coming home was like. Well, when I came home, the, uh, we, uh, when I left Hokkaido, I turned around and we looked and there was a ship sitting out in the harbor. And I said to my buddy, I said, you know, that ship is that same damn ship we came over on. He says, no, it can't be. I says, it is too. I says, I know it is. It looks like it. And as we got closer to him, we got on it, and sure enough, it was the Marine Adder, and that was a ship I came from Seattle, Washington, to Japan, from Japan to Korea. And then from Hokkaido, we came back to uh, Seattle, Washington. And it was the same ship that I uh, went over on, I came back on the same ship. 3,500 soldiers we had on that ship. 
And uh, when we got to Seattle, uh, we did have a uh, few guys. There was about, oh, I think there was three, four guys there. They had instruments that were playing. And, of course, you have all these, uh, there was a, oh, two or three DAVs, disabled vets, that were selling different things. And there was one that was a, a plaque of your outfit, your name, your rank, and uh, with your ribbons on it. And they were selling those. You could put your order in, that's what it was. And I says, ah, I guess back then it was $5 or $10 or whatever it was. So I gave the guy the money, and I filled out the sheet. And I says, well, you know, I'll probably never get it. And then they had a book on the First Calvary, and I think that was... Uh, six dollars or something like that so i filled it i said yeah send me one and I, to my surprise about six months later i got i got them and i still got them hanging up at home and the book is in the drawer i keep it it's uh, it brings back a lot of memories a lot of stories of my alpha and it's got my name in it in the back the company i was with the platoon i was with and so forth uh tell me uh, what was your reaction when the war ended my what your reaction Oh, well, my reaction was, thank God nobody else was going to have to go over there and get hurt. That's the only thing I had. I said, just thank God that nobody else was going to have to go over there. Because war, I found out after World War II, I know we had a lot of local boys at home that was over in World War II. I was drafted at the end of World War II, but I was just a little bit too late. The war had ended before I was drafted twice, as a matter of fact, 1948 and 49, but I was uh, too young. To go. The war ended and I got reclassified. It's not that I was rejected. I just got reclassified because the war ended, and, or else I probably would have caught the tail end of World War II. But uh, after that, why, uh, when Korea came along, it left me 22 years old. They took me right away, <laughs> first one. <laughs> Well, when the war ended, I came home. I worked in uh, what they used to call then, it was Hanson's Laboratory, Junker Brand Foods. Mark probably might remember that. Mm -hmm. Junker Brand Foods, I worked there. And uh, when I came home, they, of course, I used to write to them, and they told me that my job was secure after I got out of the service. And I was home probably about two weeks, and I got so bored that I says, I might as well go back to work. And uh, so I did. I went back over there, and they gave me my job. I had my job working back in Hanson's. And I worked there for, oh, probably about almost a year. And I says, you know, I can't stand the working indoors anymore. I, I was out for two years, and here I'm indoors, cooped in, working shifts. I says, the government owes me something, so I think I'll go to school. So I decided to uh, take up, so I sent for some books. And I took up sheet metal work and heating. And I found, they told me, you can go on an apprenticeship. So I found the felt. Wait a second. Are you starting to say, they told me I could go on an apprenticeship? Yes. Wait a oh, they told me I can uh, go on and take an apprenticeship up. And I was, uh, I got uh, tied up with a fellow by the name of uh, Ward Kirkendall. He was a heating and sheet metal man in Little Falls. And he hired me. He paid me so much a week, and the government paid me three quarters of my pay, what I should be getting. And every month I had to uh, fill out the book, fill out the sheet. And I, was, I did this until, oh, I think it was almost two years. And I had another three months to go. And Cherry Burroughs, Little Falls, that we were, did a lot of work for them. We did a lot of their sheet metal work. And uh, back then, I pretty good softball player. And uh, they says to me, hey, George, he says, you know, you're doing most of our sheet metal work anyway, because I used to deliver it after we made it, bring it down. He says, we're looking for a man in a sheet metal shop. Why don't you come down? You know, I said, I got three more months to go. He said, yeah, we need a guy right away. You know, he says, so they, they made me a pretty good offer. Wage per hour was almost double what I was getting. So I says, well, I can't go wrong. I might just as well take it. So I did. I told Wardy, and his work was slack then anyway. 
And he said to me, no, that was all right. We parted, good friends and everything. And I went to work for Cherry Burroughs doing sheet metal work. And, uh, well, I guess I worked about a year, and then all of a sudden things went slack then. That's back in, uh, what was it, 1956? 1956, 57, somewhere in that time, somewhere around there. And, uh, well, in the meantime, I had got married. I got married in 1955, and I needed a job anyway. I couldn't afford to not work anywhere then. And so I went from one job to another then until finally I, uh, I ended up working for an oil company, Martin Green Oil, and I was there for 33 years. But I uh, got married, and we had seven kids between the wife and I, five girls and two boys, and now we have 14 grandchildren. They're all married but one son. I have one son that's still home. He's 34, but he likes the single life. Well, I I think probably uh, if people my age probably and uh, younger and older used to read about the Civil War, and I think probably the kids today, the Civil Wars has been they should start with World War Two, they should know what Korea was about, and I think uh, Vietnam, and now I mean Desert Storm, and now what coming up we hope it doesn't end up in a war at least I do my opinion is I hope they don't have to go because I'm afraid that uh, with the weapons they have today it's going to be a mass destruction whether regardless what kind of a weapon you use I mean they have bombs to, to, to destroy anything and uh, to me I think the kids should be able to f read in the history books of what war was like and what their ancestors went through, not just say, oh, there was another thing going, that gone past, you know. I know my grandchildren don't ask me of what I did, you know, when I was in a war. They probably, half of them probably don't know that I was even in a war. Maybe the oldest ones might know because their parents might have told them, you know, my kids might have told them, but... Grandpa was a, so well, they know I belong to the Legion, and they know that, that you have to be in a war in order to belong to the Legion, so that's one of the things that uh, they, I think they, they learn, you know. If, if you're going to tell them about the sacrifices that were made by people in the war, or the World War II, or Korea, for you, <laughs> um, what are the key sacrifices you would really want them to understand? Well, they can't have everything today that uh, during the war time, a lot of things are limited. And I think today, uh, these children are going to have to learn that you're going to have to put that aside. You're going to have to give something in order to get. And if, if, they, if they believe that honestly, you know, gasoline is going to be a shortage. And I got a car, and I want all I can have. But if there's a war going on, they're going to have to sacrifice that. In the same way like we did when we were kids, we had to sacrifice different kinds of food. Everything was rationed. We didn't have it like uh, they do today. You can go to the store and buy a pound of sugar or a pound of flour, five pounds of flour, this or that. You don't have that back then. But today they do because I still have couple of uh, ration books home that the coupons are gone, but the empty books are there that I can remember. And, of course, back then, gasoline, you bought a gallon or two gallons. You didn't buy like you do today, fill it up. So these are the things these kids are going to have to know that if a war comes, there's going to be an awful lot they're going to have to give up or try to. Let's put it that way, and I hope it never comes. I want to say trial or victory. Sometimes the greatest victories come out of our trials. During your wartime, what do you think was the greatest victory? And how did that come from the trial? 
I, uh, I don't quite, I don't quite understand what you're, you're getting at on that. Uh, um, what did you find the hardest about being at war? Oh, the hardest of being at war. Well, I think probably the hardest thing of being at war is once you're in combat, uh, when you first get there, you're, you're green. But then afterwards, uh, as you go along, as the days go along, the months go along, then it becomes harder and harder to face the enemy because you're always afraid that you might be next. And when you see your buddies drop, you don't know whether to duck or whether to go on, but if you got the spirit, you go on. And that's the only thing that kept me going was my little prayers and kept going on and on day after day. And I says, well, tomorrow we'll be out of here. Tomorrow we'll be out of here. And that's the only thing I can uh, really say that saved me was that I went day by day. I know this one time we were up on, uh, we were going up a, this one hill up on Old Baldy, which was a famous, famous mountain. And probably about, I don't know how many outfits, the Marines have been up there dozens of times. It's one of the highest points over there in Korea. Everybody wanted it because you can see all over the place with it. And uh, the first calf, when we went up there, I myself, we were throwing bodies out of the trenches up there. The, the trenches were so deep that they went into like a cave. And I think over in Afghanistan, the same thing is going on over there now. They have these caves where they have like buildings inside the, the mountains where you can't find these people. And we used to drop napalm, which was uh, fuel that would ignite and burn and would roll down into these trenches and that's what killed most of these the most of the North Koreans or the Chinese when they dropped the napalm on them but I think that they myself I counted over 100 bodies we took out of the trenches and rolled them over the side of the hill because we were taken over and to me you know the the faces on the, they may have been the enemy but the faces on them Chinese boys were like babies. To me, I didn't think they were 12, 14 years old. And maybe I shouldn't say this, but some of the American soldiers were, I would say, a little bit rude by going through their pockets looking for money or looking for souvenirs, watches, and stuff like that. I just couldn't gut it. I couldn't get it myself, but the money that they picked were brand new bills. They give them a stack of bills and they send these kids. Half of them didn't have weapons. They had bugles and they had sticks and a handful of grenades, what they call concussion grenades. It was a long stick like that, that uh, like with a can on the end of it. They used to throw them down over the hill and they used to explode. Maybe they were full of BBs or fragments of glass or something like that. But they didn't have a rifle or a burp gun or anything like that to fight with. They just, maybe one out of ten had a gun. The rest of them were, I mean, just followers. That's all they were. And they sent these poor kids into battle. That's one thing about the American Army. When I, uh, when I got over to uh, Japan, Hokkaido, or uh, Yokohama, they uh, sent 117 soldiers back home because they were too young. They found out their age. They lied their age. They were only 17. They shipped them back home. They wouldn't let them stay. So uh, that's one thing, of, at least about the American soldier, although uh, some of them tried to, wanted to go over, you know, but they, they sent them home. They said, you're not too young to go in battle. So we had to ship them out. There was one kid when I was uh, in uh, the first calf over there, uh, this one kid out of my platoon. They found out he was redheaded. He was only 17 years old. And I says, hey, how'd you get in there? You know, Red, you know? He was talking, telling the story one day about how he got in, you know? And boy, they grabbed the hole right away and took him out of there and took him right off the front lines. Took him right out. So that was one good thing about the Americans anyway. We did try to protect our youth. What do you think was your greatest victory in battle? Well, the... Uh, the the greatest victory probably was when uh, we captured a hill 
and we sat on it, and uh, everybody was there. But the only problem was that once you did capture a hill, you stayed there maybe for two days, three days, four days, a week at the most, and you moved off. You went back down. You didn't go forward. You went back down the other side. We weren't there to gain ground, the way it looked to me. We were there more or less to hold off the enemy, hold them off, hold them off. And then we would back down, and they would come up there, and then we'd have to fight all the way back up to knock them back off again. It was like a seesaw, back and forth, back and forth. When the talks bogged down, real bogged down, back in August, September, the, uh, the peace talks started to go down, down, down. That's when we started to uh, push a little bit more to keep them going. Keep them going. Get the talks going. Um, if you wanted to, you want to just let somebody know something about this wartime because our young people cannot picture it. What picture do you want to leave them with? What picture would I like to leave them back then? What would you leave us today with? You know, if you had to leave something for your son or your daughter or your, your grandchildren, if you want a picture of what happened to you. Well, that I went over there and I got back alive. One of the things I always prayed for when I got over there, I says, Lord, don't let me go home with one leg or one arm. I says, if I'm going to go, take me all. Amen. And I, I really did. I prayed every night that uh, I didn't want to go home with one of my limbs missing. So you're grateful for that. I am very grateful for that. And I did. I'm not saying I, I got scratched a couple of times. I never got uh, the Purple Heart for anything because I never got wounded. You know, I did get scratched here and there, but one time they tried to get me to go to the medics. Without the first aid station, they said, you know, you get your Purple Heart. I said, like heck, it's safer here. Because we did, we did have uh, some of our own planes, our own jets, our own artillery, I, I lost a half a platoon from our, one, one of the jets that came in with a rocket and uh, hit our position because they said they had a, uh, something went wrong with a trigger housing. The guy said that they were supposed to be shooting at the hill over top of us, but instead it came in our position. Did it make you angry or did it make you or just understand that that was part of being where you were? I guess you, you have to say it was part of being where you were. I mean, mistakes are going to be made. I, we didn't carry a grudge. We didn't carry a grudge. It just had to happen. It had to happen. I had one fellow who was in my mortar squad, and uh, he says to me, uh, Dennis, I'll never forget, his first name was Dennis. And I says, Dennis, I says, you're going home. I said, you got a million-dollar wound. And he says, you think I'll be coming back, Sarge? I says, no. I said, you're going to go home. you got a million-dollar wound. And he did. He lost an arm and a leg both. And I, you know, and he didn't know it. They had gave him morphine right away. And, uh, but uh, hopefully the kid's still alive today. I don't know. But those are what just makes your gut tighten up a little bit when you get close to your men and then you lose them. Why was, the, why was it worth it? Why was it worth it? Well... When I got drafted, I was afraid they wasn't going to accept me. Because I had a, uh, when I was born, I got an awful burn on my leg. And the doctor in Syracuse wanted to uh, reject me going in the Army. And I says to him, I says, Doc, I play ball every day. I says, I'm all right. I says, what do you want me to do to prove to you that my leg's all right? He says, I want you to hop up and down on that leg 20 times. I did it 25 times for him to prove it to him that I was all right. I didn't want to be uh, rejected from going in the Army. I just, I wanted to serve my country. And I did. Thank you. I thank you for...